Welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to start out today with a question for the entire group here. And what I'd like is a show of hands as if you know what I'm talking about. MCI Warwick. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. If you do, just leave your hands. You know, this is kind of a, a loaded audience, so I would expect <laughs> that people would know them. But the reason I ask that question is the forestry camp, uh, let's see, the Warwick prison. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was sitting one day in the late or the early 80s with Dennis King on the store steps up there, and a car pulled up with a whole bunch of people in it, and they wanted to know where the Warwick jail was. So the names for what is officially MCI Warwick are abundant. And the reason I mention this is, this, in a very real way, it was kind of a place that was misunderstood in a lot of ways. Um, can there be murderers and nasty people up there? I mean, our panel here will be able to enlighten us on a lot of these things. <clears throat> I mean, that's kind of where we're here. Um, I will say quickly uh, that a lot of the information that I was expecting to find on the forestry camp hasn't been collected, doesn't seem to exist. It may exist, but it may exist in Boston, in big files and what have you. And I think it's a very worthy research uh, approach for someone who, and I think someone has already started in that direction. Um, the thing that's, that's interesting is you do get a sense of Warwick, and I will add that there were two, uh, I'll call them class three. They were minimum security uh, jails or lockups, if you want. They weren't lockups. Uh, the other one was in Monroe, and it was a very similar sort of uh, system as we uh, had here in Warwick. <coughs> George? Third one. Third one? Plymouth. Plymouth. Thank you. That I, I was looking out this way. They were looking for places that... Plymouth still uh, exists. Okay. But and, it's uh, now alcohol rehab. Well... <laughs> or substance abuse rehab. And we'll get into this more. I think one of the things, if you think about what's actually happening in Warwick and was then in Plymouth, um, and also out in Monroe was a really ambitious and difficult thing to pull off. Um, and the example that I, I've sort of thought about is that um, we have a hundred, in this particular case, more of, there were a hundred people that were, were inmates here. And the, the variety of needs that a number of those people perhaps needed or could have needed um, are really hard to supply. This is a very sort of special you don't lock them up and kind of throw the key away kind of thing. So it's, for it to succeed um, was a big demand on staff, um, just, just anybody who had anything to do with it. And I think when we get to the end, and we're going to keep this pretty much combined to essentially 1964 is when the institution opened, and uh, it closed in 1992. Um, and we're going to try to limit. There were events that occurred after and before, I will mention, because that is sort of pertinent to this, before it was part of the CCC camp system here in Warwick. And I think there was an element of, as with the CCC camps, that there's a group of young men who are ready to go to work. Um, in the 30s, they were just guys that needed work. We'll put them to work. We'll, you know, make some use out of it. And there was a similar sort of notion about what was going to happen here in Warwick, um, obviously with some, some areas that are uh, a, little, uh, a little different. Um, having said that, I think I've spoken enough. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Lisel Nygaard. Lisa. Lisa, sorry. Um, and she has been doing a fair amount of work in terms of research on all of this. Quick question. Oh, 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 Michael. It's I'm tiny. Sorry, I didn't you get didn't say it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to introduce the panelists, and thank you. I often forget this. To my left is Carol Foote. I, I better just sort of read. I know Derek by name, but I don't. Derek Essler, Liesel, and Liesel. Liesel. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Steve Kurkowski over there the panel, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hill. Okay. 
Hi everyone, my name is Liesl Nygaard. Um, I'm the secretary for the Warwick Historical Society. I started this project about a year ago and it's still kind of in the works and there's plenty of other people that I need to interview. Um, I kind of decided to do this project because like we just said, there's really not much out there for this project and I think it's an important part of Warwick's history that I think should be written about and preserved in our historical society, in our library. Um, and so I'm, I'm going about it by just interviewing people who have been a part of the prison camps, who may know the history of it, whatever I can get. Um, so I kind of did like a very brief overview, some of which we've already kind of discussed, but you know, the prison camp in Warwick was also known as the Massachusetts Correctional Institute, MCI, which started around the early 1960s on Richmond Road, which is about two and a half miles from the center of town. Um, it's across from Richard's Reservoir. It was a minimum security prison that gave around 100 inmates practical jobs, such as building roads, creating picnic areas, maintaining state forests, and there's plenty more than that. Um, I know, too, that the town did have hopes of expanding the camp, um, but because of the septic system, the commissioner of corrections ultimately had to shut it down. Um, the system was causing a slight runoff into the brook, which contaminated the wetlands, Richard's Reservoir, and it was a violation of Massachusetts Title V. Um, and the cost of upgrading the sewage system would have been around half a million dollars. Um, and then after it was shut down in 2003, the camp attracted vandalism, later causing much of the camp to be bulldozed, which is what we now see today, which is, it's practically non-existent. Okay. Um, you can still drive up there, and you can still see, I believe, the backstop is still existent, yep. and uh, a few other um, aspects. But they have made a pretty good effort at trying to make the place much safer than it was for, for many years. So um, I think at this point, what we're going to do is um, move into the kinds of things, the guys who were there, um, what sort of a activities they perform. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think uh, we'll start with Steve over there. And we can jump all over. There are also people here in the audience who are uh, who will have many contributions on the kinds of activities. Um, Steve, you came to uh, the forestry camp in... 82. 82. Yep. So it was a little over the halfway mark in yep. terms of its existence. And you basically set up a sawmill? Yep, I did. Why don't you explain? Because that, that seems an interesting, given the... Uh, uh, the potential danger of working around an open saw and all this. Um, so I could talk about the sawmill, or do you want me to talk about some of the other activities? You can talk about that? other activities and blend it into sawmill, because okay. it's it's what did the guys do? So just two things. So uh, one was um, some of the people who are my age or older, you may remember that Warwick used to play softball up there, and we'd have a softball team from go up there, go up there and play like one or two nights a week or something, or every once in a while. And the inmates also had a softball team. So um, I never went up there and played softball against the inmates, but uh, when I was hired in 1982, uh, as Steve said, I ran the, the, the sawmill. And, and, and that summer, we're gonna have a softball game with the inmates. So, so I, play, I went up there and I played on the Warwick side, the town of Warwick side, and I also, I was the boss of about six or seven guys there who would have worked in the sawmill, so they played, you know, some of them were out in the outfield when they're playing. So I still remember when I stood up at the plate there and they're all giving me all these kind of jeers, but it was really bad because I struck out the first time I was up, and the guys the next day, they would let me forget that the guys were on the <laughs> Yeah. Um, the other thing, I, I don't know if we'll talk about it, that the other thing just that, that, they, that they used to do is they, would go, they were allowed to go fishing in the evening, which was really cool because Richard's Reservoir was there. And so you had, I think you had to apply, you had to have a fishing license, and Derek might know more about this. Um, we had gear there, fishing gear and a bock and tackle, and they had worms and stuff, and they would be given the stuff by, by, the, by the officers, and by law, when you, when, when a person who works for the state has, to, has an inmate on their crew and they go off property, um, in order for that to happen, you have to have care and custody. 
So if I was in a sawmill and I wanted to bring them, say, over into the town of uh, uh, Irving and work, I'd have care and custody. Those guys are my guys. I'm responsible for them, not the prison. I mean, ultimately they are, but I'm really, I, I have to count them every single hour. So I have to see them every single hour. So going back to the fishing story, the, um, the inmates would be allowed to go, um, they get their fishing pole and it would be about, uh, I don't know, 150 yards to the road, then another 100 yards to the, to the um, to Richard's Reservoir. They were allowed to go over there and usually I think once an hour a guard would come over. Either the guard would come over if there were enough guards and count the folks that are supposed to be there, six or seven inmates. Or I think sometimes when there weren't enough guards, maybe just one or two guards on, I think the, 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 guy, the fishing guys, the inmates had to come and show themselves and wave to them. And, and the, the, the guys in the, in the, in the, the main room there for the guards, they, they always had binoculars. And they'd give them the okay and they'd go back fishing for another hour for the evening. So that's one really cool thing that they, that they got to do. And uh, I guess one more story about really cool stuff. So when I was there, the superintendent's name was George Harms. He hired me to, run, to build and run a sawmill. And he, um, one day I was going to work about, I don't know, maybe six or seven months into my work career there. And he's out on the softball uh, diamond. And he's got his clubs, his golf clubs there. And he's, he's shooting the balls over into left field with a nine iron. And I'm walking by, I'm going to work because I have to walk past him to go to work, to go to, go to the prison. And he asked me, he says, so Steve, um, you play golf? I says, yeah. He says, you want to shoot some golf balls? I said, okay. So here I am, not the inmates, but I'm, I'm shooting golf balls out, in, out, out into left field for them for about 15 minutes. Finally, I said, gee, I really got to go back to work. So I went back to work. Later on, to talk about what the inmates get to do, is there was a guy in the prison that was a very good golfer, and George Harms allowed him to bring his golf clubs into the prison and shoot the ball, ball around in the infield. So those are the kind of things that the inmates, some of the things that they got to do, which are maybe not quite on the radar. Steve, are, are these stories you want to be telling to the taxpayers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, nothing about all the times that I, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different topic, yeah, private topic. Steve, can you say how long you worked there, how many years? Ten years. So I was one of the last four um, that were there. I think it was Carol, um, John Cook, who is now deceased, um, the other maintenance guy, uh, Copet, uh, Copet, what's his first name? Mr. Oh gosh, I'm working for five years. Anyways, the, no, no. anyways Mr. Copetta, I'm just calling. He was there. So we were the maintenance guys that were closing up the prison. And so I was there for that for that period, just the four of us. And then when we closed up, we took the keys, drove away, and then that was it. And then you two. How often did they work at the sawmill? Every day. Every day? Yep. And what in particular were you making, Steve? Uh, do, you want to, do we have time for all that? Or? Steve, we have time. Please, okay, please go. Yeah. Yeah, it's very unusual that I would ask no, that question. What we're to trying talk to do is, is get <laughs> as good a sense of what the daily routines were like in the place, and then from that, maybe a sense of how this benefited, because that was the purpose of Warwick altogether, is we're taking these guys and we're going to put them into a useful, they're, they're going to learn a trade or whatever, um, that they're going to make something of themselves and that ethic is important. So you're a big piece of this, Steve, because you were, you know, you, you may not think so, but you were because of your interaction with them in, in the workspace, for one. So I'll talk about the sawmill. That was one job that they were asked to do. I'll let Derek or Carol talk about the other jobs that the inmates do. But so with a sawmill, um, there were anywhere from five to seven, three to seven guys that I had. I would ask the, the, um, the officer in, in charge, usually a lieutenant or a captain or someone, you know, I'd like to have six guys. He'd say, well, you're going to take three or you're going to take seven or eight or whatever. And so we would work every single day, sometimes in the sawmill if I had logs, or sometimes I would take them out and uh, out into the woods, in, mostly in, in, in Irving or Wendell over at Laurel Lake, and we would, we would saw firewood and also saw logs, and that was, a, that was not that much longer after um, the um, gypsy moths in whatever year that was, because there's, there's a huge amount of red oak that was just dead, standing dead wood, which is still very variable wood, very valuable wood for the sawmill business, so that's what I had my MS do, and I'd take them out all day, and we'd 
cut down logs, drag them out of the woods, and I'd hire a truck and bring them in. We'd saw them up, and then that lumber would go down to um, down to Concord, where there was a 35,000 board foot kiln down there. They'd dry that and make it into furniture. And that furniture that you go and that you sit on, the wood furniture in the uh, like in the courthouse or something, that's the kind of furniture that was made from from that wood. So yeah, so I had Steve. What what sort of equipment did you guys have? Um, you didn't have a sawmill out here at the, or did you? Yes. Had, yeah, I did. You had a sawmill. Yeah. What was was it a chase mill? It was a chase. It was halfway. So Chase at that time, for those of you who may not know, used to be a company down in um, Orange who had a. Um, they built um, chase sawmills, and they built three different sizes because there was a ton of sawmills around here, forty years ago. Every there was probably. <laughs> Ten of them within ten miles. Yeah. Maybe that's an exaggeration. Maybe only five. And but um, so Chase built um, what they call a tractor mill, a number one mill, and a number two mill. And so mine was halfway in between a number one mill and a, and a tractor mill. So it was one of the small ones. It was an all wood carriage. But they had already. But it was, it was also built for the hurricane of '38. Uh -huh. So a lot of that lumber was was sawed by that mill that the state had, and that. That mill was down, I forgot the name of the town, it was down by Connecticut, down the bottom of the Quabbin. And when, when, when I had heard that, or when my boss heard that there was a sawmill to be had, he sent me down there. And that's a sawmill that I moved up here with my inmates. We put it all in the back of a truck, and three or four trips we had a sawmill. And so and I, then, yeah, a building was built, and, and I bought an edger, and so we could start making a little bit of lumber. Another question, Steve, is what, um, Responsibilities did the inmates have vis-a-vis -vis heavy equipment, chainsaws, all of that kind of stuff, and what sort of were their liability issues? And Derek, you can speak up too. Well, in 1975, um, part of the prison camp was also environmental management, and there was a carpentry shop, and um, we did all the heavy equipment operating uh, in this western part of the state. We built the roads, did the lighting. Part of that was making picnic tables in the in the winter time. And the inmates, three or four inmates would come over and, and help with that. But we also took them out into the woods and did forestry work with them. And they would be running chainsaws and okay, axes, nice. which was a little unnerving, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was the purpose of it. Um, but that's only a fraction of it. Well, then from there, the superintendent uh, asked me to come work for the Department of Corrections. And Debbie and I were about to get married, and I'm a marine biologist. And I had a, an offer to go back to the Caribbean and work, oh. or the prison. Caribbean <laughs> 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 prison. Total no brainer, right? <laughs> One paid a lot better. And, and so, you stayed married, Debbie? I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, one year. <laughs> 22 years later. <laughs> wow. But, uh, when they hired me, I was a, a counselor, which is a misnomer. You don't do much counseling. You're really a case manager. And then I was um, the director of classification and the senior counselor. But the counselors also did a lot of the work that the officers did. Transportation duties, hospital details. Mm -hmm. You took them to parole boards. Um, you did take them out on work details. But you also had all the case management you had to do. And you were kind of in between the officers and, and Boston. You know, you were the ones that wrote up all the case histories and kept track of what they were doing and made recommendations to Boston about these guys. Uh, this is, I'm, we'll get to you in a second, Carol, because oh, Carol was doing it. You were tutoring and doing that kind of thing, helping? I, I don't no, no, that was Barbara Walker. She okay, okay. Um, just a sort of overall question, and I throw it to all three of the people who were on the inside. Um, did you get any sense of job satisfaction uh, on the part of the guys that worked there? Did they get into what they were doing? The work release program, to me, was beneficial. We had um, inmates working in Gardner at all the, all the uh, mills there, mm -hmm. uh, Orange at the casket factory, um, and for those people, it's probably the first time they had a job. Okay. And they enjoyed the fact that, first of all, they were getting money, um, but they could interact with nor others. normal people. They got out for the day. Mm -hmm. And I think from that, and also that they were learning a job skill. Okay. 
So that was very beneficial. That was the intent of what they were really hoping to do with them, <coughs> that, that type yeah. of system. Um, have, have any of the inmates come back, and, and have you seen any of them since they... I used to run into them frequently, <coughs> not just from... I also worked a lot of other prisons, but... Sure. Um, the one thing they'd always say, remember me. <laughs> you, know, and you wonder, you know, hopefully I didn't make them too mad. <laughs> but uh, that, that was frequent. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, now it's been 40 years. Yeah. 20 years from me retiring, and you don't do that anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a couple that were invited to, to be here. No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, um, Steve, which is sort of too bad. Someone give us an idea of how long were the inmates <coughs> or the residents <coughs> staying there? Like, typically, what would be their tenure? It was, it was at the end of their, um, their incarceration. So, typically, maybe two to three years or less. But you also had uh, the only crimes that could not be there were sex offenders and first degree life, second degree life, second degree murder. You could be at war with. Those guys may never get out. They, they're eligible, they were eligible for parole after 15 years. That didn't mean that they were going to get parole. Just, just a little, uh, so yeah, so second degree murder, is, first degree is the worst, right, Derek? Yeah. Yeah, so I worked, I had second degree murderers on my crew. And, uh, but as far as sex offenders, if I'm, is it a correct statement to say that if a guy is currently serving for a, for, for a sex offender, but, he, but he could, if he had a sex offense, offense that he was guilty of before, he could still be there if he was serving on a different crime? No, any, any sex offense that would okay. disqualify him. <coughs> okay. Let me just say real quickly, um, you guys are all part of this. I mean, I seem to be uh, right now occupying the airways, but... Uh, what have we got? We have, yes, we have a question back there, and uh, well, we'll... I, I remember a time when um, Steve was the chief of police in town, and I don't know if it was Steve or Bob Polka who spoke up at town meeting after several inmates had walked away, and the town was a little concerned about that, and their response was, just leave your keys in the car, that way they don't have to come to the house. I'm not sure that was my response. Uh, and you may be setting me up for that, but that's, um, that's fine. And that's, that's another whole aspect which I think there will be a lot of conversation on, which is, and this is another thing about the forestry camp, MCI Warwick, uh, the jail and all of this, is when they left unannounced, Sometimes it was referred to as walkaways, uh, escapees. I mean, there were all sorts of negative terms that could be applied to it. So uh, that was interesting. But that's a whole body of discussion that we're going to get on into. And I know that there are people here who have all kinds of fun stories about things that did occur there. But let's, any more questions? I mean, we will obviously have more questions for Derek and for Steve. Um, I, I think the thing I'm really interested in at right now is just, um, whether the program was satisfying, I'll say, the needs of the bureaucrats who set the program up. That's not a big need, but it's, that's the intention. And whether that overflowed and actually was successful insofar as the guys who were the inmates did have a certain amount of job satisfaction and ended up with decent jobs. Any sense of what the recidivism rate um, was like? I'm sure it was very high. Um, I don't have a number, but... Um, Even coming out of a, a Warwick situation? Yeah, you're still an ex-inmate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Who's going to hire you? They used to give $50 gate money. And we used to always make a joke, well, that's, that's enough money to buy your first gun so you can go back to doing... Why are you your expert at? Because nobody's going to hire you. Okay. With few exceptions. That's where the work release probably helped a little bit because they had a history with Certain. a particular um, company they might keep them on. Now, whether the townspeople like that or not, because now you have somebody who's moved into town who's a felon, or an ex-felon. Right. Um, but, I mean, in, in reality, when somebody goes to prison and gets out, their future is pretty dubious. Okay, I mean, that's, that's an important point, and how does one, how do you deal with it? I don't think we've figured it out yet. Yeah, okay. There is, you know, there is no easy answer, and, uh, you know, the work release programs were a great idea, and the, and the state killed them. 
because it turns out the legislator said, well, you can't compete with private industry. Okay, so yeah. what are you going to do? You make license plates. I mean, there were some great programs. Gardner had, um, or Shirley, had uh, the uh, furniture making. Uh, Warwick had an auto automotive shop. Um, they used to make brooms. They did all sorts of things other than license, license plates, but uh, no politics killed it. It's just a quick aside. We all know James McRae. I like to call him James because who's that? Jim McRae, <laughs> who I work with and is a town's person and is actually playing a musical instrument today. Surprise, surprise. He had this story where he was down on Cape Cod picking up something or doing something and he got to talking to the guy and he said, where are you from? Jim said, I'm from Warwick. And he said, oh, you see my Buick here? Buick was made beautiful in Warwick, and it was. And Jim sort of, I think he may have taken some pictures and, yeah. uh, and all of that, but that was a good one. Again, you're competing with local companies, you know, so they didn't like it. Good. Yeah. So, Michael. Yeah, I um, was talking with uh, Steve Kay there uh, one day, and uh, I had my shop going up in Warwick. I wasn't down in uh, Northfield yet. It was a nice, nice little shop. And uh, he said uh, that there was a fellow uh, who was incarcerated at uh, uh, Warwick, and he was actually a pretty smart guy, uh, very affable, and he had some good woodworking skills. Would I, would I be interested you know, in, in taking him on? And um, I can't remember all the specifics of it, but I remember I paid him, and we gave him a, you know, we got a, a, a wage, and uh, it really turned out to be a great thing. I think he left. Warwick, right, from, I mean, he was working with me, then he, we got to the end of that, he stopped, and I think he left right after that, didn't he? Yeah, his name was Ray, I can't yeah, remember. Ray Baum, yeah. yeah. And he was released, is what you're saying? He was yeah. released, and then? He, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was just, it was great. I mean, he was, you know, he was definitely an addition to the shop. The guys liked him. You know, it wasn't like, hey, we got a prisoner here. It was just a regular guy. Yeah. Do you remember how long he worked for your company? I don't know, Steve. A year and a half ago. Yeah, Climbing them, yeah. yeah. I gave him a ride every day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was closest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Yeah. 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 Really nice Just guy. a young guy that made a big mistake. Yeah. Mm. Yep. He, he, was, he was out drunk and he did something wrong. Yeah. One little thing. Okay. I believe he moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm. New start. Yeah. Claire. Question? Maybe Carol can well, share. Carol, what did you, you were a bookkeeper? Is that yes. what you were doing? I took care of their very little money, but their very dear money, you know. They, if they worked and did get some money, plus visitors, I received that, put it in their account, and then weekly, if anyone asked for a printout of what they had, I gave it to them and also on Thursday evening well more than that but Thursday they could get a roll of quarters if they had it of course in their account and uh, I would distribute those rolls of quarters which they could spend then on the vending machines or cigarettes at that time prisoners were allowed to smoke uh, I don't know that they can anymore. I, they stopped. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's been 20 they years. They stopped at Gardner. Yeah, not legally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, that was mm -hmm. my job. And also, I had the duty of <clears throat> taking this money to the bank, and I could drive a cruiser. And that was <laughs> <laughs> In plain clothes, you'd see the cars go back. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, they, the uh, superintendent made sure I had a vehicle because it was. I was also picking up in Gardner the, the people that work their paycheck, and so that was also part of the whole deal of orders and that. And they, they. You know, that was important, and so 
Uh, I had very little to do with them. I saw them, the ones that had money, I saw them to give them their quarters. And if, you know, a printout was necessary, you know. Other than that, I really, I never ate there. I, I was in the front of the building. So weren't you, Derek? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I would see them walk by to visit him or the other counselors or, or you know, that sort of thing, or walking on doing things. But on a whole, I, I was in my little cubicle, and that's where I stayed. How long did you work there? Uh, I started in 87, and then when, when did the MCI close? 92. Mm -hmm. From 87 to 92, and then it, we had a choice if we wanted to s go to a medium or a maximum security prison, and I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to go any farther than Gardner. Lots of the correctional officers went to Shirley because that was a minimum, but mine had barbed wire, and at that time they had um, um, German shepherds. Um, dog patrol and um, however I again didn't that I had more contact with them then because the treasurer's office was half in, in front of barbed wire and half of it was beyond barbed wire so I had to go in every every week to talk about what I do with my inmate accounts so I met some yes uh, how much were they remunerated for their efforts Very in Saul or anywhere else? Uh, it was like 50 cents a day or a day. Well, I, 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 that was actually the question I was going to ask Carol. I, yeah. I know the yeah. answer to that one. Yes. But, yes. So yes. there was actually Very two different work little. programs Very there. There was the inmates that, in order to be there, you had to work. Yeah. That was it. If you and no work, infractions. They'd kick you they'd, out. Yeah. Sometimes work can be, if, I suppose if you're a really good golfer, maybe you could stay a little longer <laughs> if you're willing to give the superintendent some, some tips. But um, so, so most of the, most of the crew, the, the, the guys who cleaned the buildings, who did all the cooking, went on a half a dozen crews of vans. We would send some to Templeton, some to uh, different towns, sometimes they'd come here to work. They get paid, I think it was around two dollars a day. Yeah. The guys at the sawmill, I think they started at a dollar a day, and I could I could bump them up to maybe four dollars a day. So they were they were like the big pair. So my my, <laughs> my guys are really. And then after they did that, when they're within, a, was it a certain amount of time when they're within within their release date, Derek? They got to do um, be on work release and get yeah, a job was, on the outside. Well, well that I don't was, know what the rules were. That was through the classification system. Classification, yeah. So they got classified at some point to be on work release. Then they could go out into the community and, and work at the casket factory and make a wage. So it was two different groups. And there would be, every single morning, there'd be maybe a van or two that would come along or they'd get rides to go to wherever, or a micro shop to go there and get paid a regular wage. All to help them to try to get back in society successfully. That was the, the thought of it. Mm -hmm. So, Carol, you did all that money, right, Carol? The two dollars yes. a day plus the all the paychecks. Yes. Yeah. And all the visitors that came on visitors' days, many of the the people would bring money, mm -hmm. extra money, and so I had to put that money into their accounts. Louise, you had a question? Yeah, I'm interested to hear you talk, Steve, about how you would, you know, it's it's a work program. So I'm imagining that developing your your relationships with them was valuable, whether the prison camp thought it was or not, but, you know, that that was a part of it. But then you had different amounts of, of workers that you asked for on different days, depending on what work you had for them. So I'm just wondering how that worked for um, the guys who wanted to really just work with you on a regular basis. And they were assigned to several different crews every day. We had people going to uh, Templeton to help there. We went down to Rutland Hospital. Uh, so they were assigned. They didn't ask which one they wanted to be on. Oh, okay. right. I think uh, Steve's might have been a little different. but uh, So they rotated around? They, they were sent where they were needed. Yeah. Um, and that varied from day to day. I mean, there were regular programs. They were at Templeton until it closed, or we closed, one or the other. 
Um, same with uh, Nichols and Stone, and I mean that was a regular daily. So like they had exposure, but it wasn't like a a pre um, uh, you know getting you ready for a. Um, well, the idea was to make a gradual transition, and there were also halfway houses right. that. Um, they could then be sent to a halfway house, which was even more, less restrictive. Uh, they were mostly all in Boston. So it was about, it sounds like it was about them being able to work and be responsible about working, yeah. not necessarily... Instead of just throwing them out the door, training. which they do with all the other yeah. higher security, you know, it's kind of a shock. You've been 10 years behind bars, and all of a sudden you're out on the oh, street yeah, where the right work with you, so at least allowed you to feel like, well, you're somewhat normal before you're kicked out. And that was good, I think. And recreationally, didn't they have um, boxing We had there? the boxing Because I remember ring. going right. to an event there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I moved here in 89, and I, can't, I still have this memory of being yeah. inside the prison. Yeah. And I was like, what? Yeah, I'm not sure that was ever a really good idea or not. <laughs> <laughs> That ring actually came from the YMCA in Athol. That's, yeah, okay. That right, and they sense. said, well, what are we going to do with it? And somebody said, well, we'll send it up to the prison camp. Oh, God. And I have a feeling it um, probably saved some stabbings. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we had it for very long. Usually people don't say, let's, you know, duke it out in the ring. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, that's too... So it didn't work that way. Was, well. was there a basketball court? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, we had the interior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One on the outside. Uh, yeah. Nothing yeah. inside. So maybe just a quick little story to illustrate. Uh, maybe you guys don't know about this, but um, to illustrate your point about um, them choosing, as you think they may have done, Louise on pr cruise, they didn't choose. The 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 lieutenant or whoever the shift commander was told them you are going to Templeton, or you're going, that's where you're working for the day, that's your assignment. So, some of you folks have been in town a little bit longer than, than others, you may know what KKK means, um, and it's not the unit down in the south, south of this country, but when I worked for Steve Clark in, in the early 70s, there were eight employees, seven of us had first names of Steve. So I was given the name KKK, that was just my handle. So triple K. Triple K. Triple K. Triple K. Yes. Right, triple K. So the reason I'm telling you that story is because one time I had guys, I had my regular crew um, that I usually ped three or four guys, but I need a few more guys for the job that I was doing. So I went to the, the officer lieutenant and I said, gee, I could use a couple more guys. So he assigned me these two guys. Turns out they're two black guys. And I didn't have any problem with that. That's fine with me. It didn't matter to me. They refused to work with me. <laughs> they, re they refused to work with me, and finally they said, "It's interpreted." Yeah, yes. they they found that they found out that well, he's he's with the Ku Klux Klan. That's what that's what. <laughs> I don't know if you found that out, Derek, or somebody found that out in the prison. They they forgot. They uh, think right. I was with the Ku Klux Klan, and I'm going to take them out in the woods with the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah, it sounds funny. I mean, it's too bad because. I can't remember if I went back and talked to them, I told them that's not me, but they didn't believe me. But they ended up getting locked up into the one or two cells that we had, and they got shipped back to higher security because they didn't do what the shift commander told them to do. Uh, it's it's kind of sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of sad, but that's yeah. where they, yeah, they didn't get a choice. A question? Yeah. Uh, well, I just can we just talk a little bit about the physical plant or facilities? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Dorms, like yeah, there, there were to care uh, work two ways. Cubicle. No, they, they, um, it was very much like a, a camp. <laughs> you know, you had uh, beds in an open dorm, okay. two wings, and that was it. Like a mess hall? Yeah, they had a mess hall. Yeah, that kind of stuff? They had a library of full, sorts full for a while. Five days. <laughs> yeah, that didn't last too long. But um, there, there really wasn't much as far as entertainment. You had a TV. Well, I'm really concerned, like, their dorms, open dorms, they had a rec hall, kitchen, a building for staff? No, the staff, well, you had an administrative building okay. that all the staff were in, was mm -hmm. in one building. Okay. Um, and they had, you know, separate offices. 
Right. And you had the front office, which was where the guards would process people and coming And there was a guard station in the drive, you go up to there the used driveway. To be like that, like, like, and there was I, one out front initially. And that was, but, only, that was only for visiting days. Yeah. Okay. And generally, we used to go up on weekends to show the colors. That was Roddy's term. Rod Whipple, who is not with us, but... Uh, and basically, we would go up to the administrative, and there was that door at the end, and there would be a duty we officer. Had, we right had the, the building where the officers could sleep over. Okay. Because they would do the yes, shift work. The and then there was a, a separate little cottage. Um, yeah. yeah. Building that and they we would just visitors in we're here, and they say, hey, great, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was, everything was in one building, except okay. for the uh, automotive shop. Okay. And uh, in the basement, you had the generator that could run everything if necessary. How often were, was it every hour that um, the inmates had to it's Just like any other prison, every okay. hour they have to be counted. Bed check or whatever, and they'd be. So they had an hour head start. <laughs> don't, don't tell me about that, we'll get to that. George. <laughs> so, I'm a, Dana. Well, uh, somebody mentioned entertainment. I grew up in Orange and uh, Somehow, the high school music department was asked to go up and do a program or two up there. It must have been right near the beginning of it. Because I was uh, maybe a sophomore in high school, so that, that would have been like 65 or 66. Okay. That would be so we would go up and, and the music director would bring enough people so that we could have a small band plus a small chorus. Now, I can remember doing that twice. Um, I don't remember much about it. We must have been in the mess hall. You know, yeah. where else could you be? There might have been 20 of us that went, maybe 25. Wow. But I can remember doing that twice. I can also remember going up and playing softball. And uh, must have been a miracle. I got on first base somehow. <laughs> and uh, it was in the evening, in the springtime. So you can imagine the bugs were a little thick. So I'm swatting away and I said, boy, the bugs are thick and really bad up here. And the first baseman was a big black fella said, not as bad as the time. <laughs> said, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. seldom did I, you know, it, that's the only interaction I ever had with them, really. Yeah. Now, I lived on, I live on Hastings Heights, and no, the only thing I can remember, Catherine reminded me of it today, was uh, once the prison closed, we had a whole lot less pampers on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so the families would come up and... Yeah. Get rid of them. <laughs> a, a general question, um, what were, and I'm kind of looking at George and some of the older people in the audience, um, how did the town in 1964, it was presented to the town, this jail that was going to be put in your town, how did the town respond immediately, you know, when it was avenged, when it happened, and how long did it take for it to become part of the area. Because I can remember in the 70s, um, it was pretty much, as far as the police department, it was a kind of routine, and it wasn't a big deal. But initially, I can imagine, it might have been a little hard to take. I don't know, that's a question. Well, <clears throat> when, this, <clears throat> when this idea was floated, we were invited, anybody that was interested in going on a tour, of Monroe. We all gathered up here at the fire station and carpooled and we went off for the day up to Monroe just to see what it was all about. They didn't have a dormitory, they had cabins. And we toured the place and they gave us lunch and then we came home and then Shortly thereafter, you know, the decision was made to start the camp up here. And I don't know whether I'm saying the right name or not. Uh, it seems to me a gentleman by the name of Dinsmore. <coughs> he was he he was really gung ho about this program. Hmm. You know, of he was in the Department of Corrections. His name was Dinsmore. I think he operated out of Plymouth, and he was a big believer in this. And I think he came to a couple of our meetings or town meetings and spoke. And then 
the rest is history, you know. They well, up, how was it after it came to town? Were people suspicious? Were people... Well, you know, uh, uh, we didn't have many problems in town per se. Yeah. You know, they did work <coughs> for the highway department, right. and paint the town hall, you know, different mm -hmm. things. It was, School, it was, it was acceptable. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so they got acclimated pretty quickly. That was kind of my yeah. question. I heard that there was sort of a period where you know, we're not absolutely sure, but that's good, because certainly when I was here, it was just part of the landscape. Yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> you know, one, one thing that I can say at this point, I, I do want to speak a little bit about some escapes that I was involved in <laughs> and fire incidents that I was involved in. But I, I can say this, all the people, all the inmates that came up there weren't necessarily what you consider a criminal. You know, they might, in my estimation, they might have just been a crook. <laughs> all right, don't I can it think of is a gentleman by the name of Francis Kiernan. He was an engineer and he was involved with the construction of the underground garage under the Boston Common. And he got involved with some hanky-panky with the money and he got caught. And he was sent to prison and he, sent, he spent the last months of his term up here. I remember the guy, Francis Kiernan. I consider him a white collar inmate. An Italian guy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> another, another one that I can remember was a registry inspector by the name of Silva. I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Silva. S-I-L-B-A. He got caught. You know, today we we have this big immigrant immigrant problem. But 60 years ago, he was caught selling licenses to immigrants. They didn't have to pass the exam. They didn't have to take a road test. He was just selling licenses. So he got caught. And he served the final months of his term up here. You know, another white collar inmate, as I call him. And I, I can remember, he had a car with a um, um, what are the number plates here? I was going to say it's a vanity plate. Vanity plate. S I L V A was his vanity plate, and I can remember every Sunday, his wife used to go by my house in that car with the plate. She was going up there Sunday afternoon for visiting. That's the one day a week that family could go <laughs> and visit. And I can remember that car going by the house, S-I-L-V-A, vanity plate. <laughs> All the people sent to Warwick had gone through screening, years of screening, which starts at Concord. And, you know, they've had to prove themselves um, that they could be trusted enough. And uh, so you, you really, in theory, never got the worst of the worst. They never got out from behind the walls. <coughs> um, some would slip through. Some knew how to play the game. Hmm. But I would say the majority of the people that um, <coughs> were at Warwick, I, I would say 20% of them, you probably could have found something better for them to do other than throw them in jail. And especially the drug offenders. They were all nickel and dime kids off the streets. You know, that um, you, you never got the even middlemen, let alone the, the big druggies. Uh, those kids, you probably could have handled that better. So, I mean, you really didn't have the bad, the bad ones that, that you get at the other facilities, in theory. Another question, is that Mr. Ross? It is. Yeah, you know, it was really the state that was the bad actor in that whole thing. Uh, Jack Cadwell and I were on the Board of Health uh, at a period of time when I drove by there one morning on the way to a logging job at 10 below zero and that brook from the prison to Richard's Reservoir was running like mad with a lot of steam and everything coming out of it. 
and I'm up in the woods, you know, further on, they're going to log and jump, and I'm freezing to death, wondering, well, how is that running? Come back, it turns out that the stream is then empty, but full of suds all around it. So I called, uh, you know, the, <coughs> uh, the, the prison camp to find out, well, was there some release or something that happened up there? And they said, oh, no, no, we can do that. We have a permit. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you can't get a permit to discharge into the headwaters of a lake. So they said, check with the DEP. So I contacted DEP, uh, Roland Dupuis, who was the, the regional manager in Springfield. He said, uh, oh, I'm sure they've got a permit. I'll send it to you. Well, a month later, nothing ever happened. So I said, hey, I'm going to be in Springfield today. I'd like to come by and pick that up. I get to his office, he's got this big desk with a long table in front of it, you know, where everybody sits. And there's this big file at the end of the table. He says, I think it's in there. And I started looking in the file and there was no permit, but there were, it turns out that whole prison camp was built on a wetland. They filled that whole wetland in to build that camp there. That's why they had water problems there. That's why they couldn't build anymore. And so I said, well, look, I'd like a copy of this file. And he said, well, that'll take hours. And I said, well, I'll just sit right here. <laughs> and I sat in his office until he finally got it. He tried to get me to go sit up front. And I said, no, no, I think I'll sit here. I'm chair of the board. You're supposed to help me. <laughs> so eventually we got it. And that's when the state made their decision that, no, we can't invest any more money in this place. Because they couldn't continue to direct discharge their waste into Richard's Reservoir. Mm -hmm. That's why it's turned into such a eutrophic area. I used to go up there and fish with my kids, too. They love to at fish those at that fish. point, we had a, a federal um, yeah. a director, a, com a, a commissioner, and that uh, he had already decided that uh, the prison camps were going. Yeah. That was just the yeah. final straw. Because yeah. they, they closed uh, Monroe in 78, yeah. um, and all of the staff at Warwick knew that the axe was over your head, just a matter of when. And, um, they talked about it for probably five years before they actually closed it. And they were trucking a lot of water out even, too, every day. Every yes. drop. Mm -hmm. uh, every <coughs> shower, <coughs> bath, water. water, everything. Every day a big tanker came in and Fresh emptied. Water. The Bring in water and take out waste. Take right. out the take waste. waste. So like a tank tank out waste. Waste. Daily, yeah. daily. Yeah. Yeah. That That's good. Cool. Didn't they start doing that after you discovered the... Who knows when they started doing it, but they kept claiming they had a permit to do it until we went through the whole file and found out, no, there was no permit. Mm -hmm. The state never issued that permit, so they just kept discharging into the lake until somebody caught them. And that's why Richard's Reservoir is not really a, it's not much water. They, they put so many nutrients into it, it just turned it almost into a meadow so quickly. And that's, after that happened, that's when they decided to come inspect our landfill. <laughs> and they just, you know, <laughs> closed the landfill. They were on top of us from the bad landfill for a long time after that. Well, it seems we've, we've hit on a topic that actually sort of moves us into the, the next area here, which is probably where the town of Warwick had the most interaction with the forestry camp, MCI Warwick. And I'm going to say, and I'm looking at you, Lenny, here, um, which is the topic that's been mentioned by George and other people. Uh, it's referred to as walkaways, pleasantly, escapes, or whatever, and there is quite a litany of events that have occurred around that. So, I think I may be inclined just to kind of throw it open. George, you had a few things, and I, I do want to hear from Lenny Crossman here, who is a former state police officer out of the Athol Barracks and other places, and he has a pretty remarkable story, which I'd love for you, Lenny, and a little while of this to share with people about uh, a, a walk away and escaping. But George, you had a couple of things, and I think Clyde back there had Yeah, well, I think, uh, I've got to stand up here. <laughs> okay. Because i got to show and tell, maybe. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can remember three incidents that involved us here in the town of Walden directly. Most of the time, the inmates that, des that decided to leave, they would have a friend or a girlfriend or a wife waiting up the road, and they would take a walk, and they'd jump in the car, and they were long gone. But one incident that I can recall was Arthur Bowers. 
He used to go up to the camp on a daily basis and pick up table scraps, leftovers, garbage, and take it down to the farm to Big feed pigs. his critters. Pigs. Pigs. And one day, just as he was kind of getting to his pickup truck, an inmate jumped in and threatened him and told him to drive him away. And they went down the Richmond Road, up Hastings Heights, down North Main Street, and lucky for that, they had to stop for a red light in Orange Center. And that allowed him to turn the thing up, grab the keys, and he got out and he was running all over Orange Square, <laughs> all over, you know, there's an escaped prisoner in my truck. <laughs> I think the other thing to is just the image of Arthur running. Arthur, <laughs> 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 They, at, at, the, at the same time, this, this guy booked it, and at the same time, I understand there was a slow-moving freight train going through Orange, and they assumed that he jumped onto that, because as far as I ever found out, he was one of the few inmates that escaped that they never got back. You know, most of the time, they would get these inmates back because they would just uh, stake out their home or their hometown and they'd eventually find them. Another one that I can think of is Ed Gillespie. Ed Gillespie lived in the house right across from the prison camp where Lynn Mangreen lives now. And Ed was the tax collector in town at the time. And in those days, we could we could go to the tax collector's house and pay taxes. I can remember paying excise taxes to Howard Anderson when he lived right up here by the church. And then Ed Gillespie <coughs> took over. And we would go to his house, and you could pay that. They would have some office hours at the town hall, but you could do a lot of stuff right at their home on the kitchen table. Same with Betty Earl with uh, town clerk work. So anyways, Ed was home one day. That house is designed with, there's a big kitchen on the back side of the house, and then a, a, a room to the north, and then the front was a living room and a dining room. And the door going in went into the kitchen. And you knocked on the door, and he'd say, come in. Well, one day, an inmate came in and forced him to drive away. And they came down here to the center of town, and I, I don't remember the circumstances, but Ed either talked him into giving himself up, or Ed did the same thing. But he pulled up in front of Oscar Rosen's house. And of course, inmates all knew Oscar because he worked for the state. He was involved with DCR all, all over. So uh, the guy sort of gave himself up, and Oscar went in the house and called the camp, and they came down and got him. After that, every time you went to Ed's house to pay taxes, you knocked on the door. And he would say, come in. And he was on the opposite side of the kitchen in that dark room. <laughs> and he had a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not he kidding. <laughs> he had a shotgun inside that dark room on the other side of the kitchen. Wow. Yeah. The third one I can recall was one that I was involved with myself. A couple of guys walked away from the camp, and they didn't have a ride. They were snooping around town trying to find what, how they were going to get out of town, what they were going to do. Charlie Lincoln was uh, police chief then. So I was on the police force for six years, from 68 to 73. I took over as fire chief, so I got off for a while. And then Steve talked me into getting back on the police force later. But I was on the police force 68 to 73, so it happened sometime in that time period. People around town were calling Charlie 
house, you know, tell them they thought they spotted these guys. Somebody said, called them and said they thought they saw them walking down to Hastings Pond from Route 78 on what is now Echo Park Road, you know, goes down to the camps. So Charlie called me, and I met him there at the beginning of the road, and we drove down in there, looked around, and we didn't see anything. For some reason, Charlie said to me, take your gun out and crank off a couple into the woods. <laughs> so I did. All of a sudden, these two cars come out. <laughs> <laughs> they were ready Great. to be caught. <laughs> they were tired. They were hungry. They were bug bitten. They wanted to be captured. So I held my pistol on them two guys while Charlie put the handcuffs on. We loaded them in the back of Charlie's car. You know, in those days we didn't have a cruiser. We used our own personal vehicles. <laughs> and we took the two guys back up to the camp. And that was the only time in my 25 years or 30 years of being on the police force that I ever took my pistol out of the holster <laughs> in an official police action. <laughs> I got some fire stories to tell. <laughs> That's why you were invited, George. Uh, Clyde, would you? Uh... Yeah. Um, when, in the early '80s, uh, when there was a lot of these walk-offs happening. Uh, I joined a, uh, the town decided to form a liaison committee with the, with the camp and I was on that first committee and, uh, and we just wanted to have some interaction between the town, communication between the town and those that ran the camp. And uh, I remember that first meeting at the town hall and uh, the warden, uh, Mr. Hale, uh, I think, was it Hale, the warden? Hale, I thought it was Harms. That was probably George Harms at that point. Oh, Harms, Harms. okay, George right, Harms. George Harms. And and John Cook was the assistant. And I remember them coming in, and John Cook had a, the biggest briefcase I've ever seen in my life. And he set that on the table, and he pulled out all these notes, uh, folders, and everything. And he had every kind of bureaucratic fact you could ever ask for in there, as far as what in my mind, you know. And we found, and we were kind of intimidated by the whole thing. And uh, that was kind of our initial thing. And then, as it turned out. Uh, John ended up moving to town, and he was, you know, just just the greatest, most affable guy you could ever ask for. And uh, but when they came to that first meeting, it was like they were. We felt like they were going to just mow us over or something, you know. And uh, but then, as people got to know each other, it was much better. But. One of the things I asked uh, John, it was, why do these guys walk off? They're near the end of their term. Uh, what's going on? Why, why did they do that? And, and what he told me was that these guys, you know, they are, they are in there for whatever they did, and they're not always, you know, the sharpest knife in the drawer or, or, or this kind of thing. And, uh, but what happens is they go up for parole. And sometimes this might be the fourth, fifth, sixth time they've gone up for parole and they think they're gonna get it. And then they get turned down. Mm -hmm. And then they just get discouraged and they just lose it and away they go. <coughs> so, um, There was a policy that as soon as they were denied parole, they were sent back to higher security. 
Mm. Mm -hmm. But the ones that were escaping had parole. I mean, <clears throat> several times where a guy's going to leave in three days on parole. He escapes, goes to Boston and murders somebody. How do you rationalize yeah, yeah. that? There is, there is no way to do that. They're in their own, their own little worlds, and um, <coughs> there's no way to anticipate that either. Derek, um, our understanding, and I'm not sure Lenny and maybe George, um, our understanding was that if someone who was at Warwick escaped, um, that they would immediately, they would basically be breaking out of jail, and that there was a Massachusetts mandate, and was it five years? We were given a number that they would be in Concord or the big yeah, house. They yes. would, first of all, they'd never get back to lower security again. Totally. And but, uh, but they would they, have an additional charge placed. Yeah. But it was pretty substantial, was the thing. And I, yeah, yeah I, I think a couple of the times that, you know, the, the kid, as many times was the case, you know, he had six months to go. Sure. And I think to answer your question, there was also the kind of, ooh, he did it, maybe I'll do it. It's sort of, they become almost in vogue. Lenny and I talked about this a thousand years ago. Why are these guys doing this? And the parole piece was part of it, but I think it might be their age, and oh, you know, he can do it and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's... Yeah, again, there's no... But some of them were institutionalized and couldn't handle it on the outside. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... Um, I think that, for Warwick, that's probably a pretty low mm -hmm. number, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly with your higher security. Yeah. Um, they don't know what to do on the outside. They have no family. They have no support. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, at least I get fed in there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we But the other, the other ones, yeah. what were they thinking? That's really true. Some, some were on drugs. A question that's kind of related to what you've been talking about. How did the prisoners dress when they were at the camp and or did they wear those orange jumpsuits or no, something that, when uh, they no, went off to, to work in Templeton or what have you? I mean, did they have regular clothes on? Yeah, they just had regular clothes. They weren't, there were no uniforms mm -hmm. except for the officers. So, okay, so someone walking away, you wouldn't notice. No. Right. So okay. when I had the... Um, it reminds me of a little story. I like to tell the stories. If you've got a story, point. Steve. Yeah, i got a story. So, um, so my crew used to go out and cut firewood in Irving, like I've told you before. And then sometimes we'd get done early and I would take them swimming. That was one thing. Sometimes I would take them downtown. And if they're um, of a pre-release oh, okay. status or very low security, <laughs> maybe let them go into town. Maybe I would go in with them and say we go to the 7-Eleven to buy it. And they would have a little bit of money. They'd go and buy a candy bar or whatever. <laughs> I can remember this one time I went in and let, I let, let the, about three guys go in at a time, the other three guys go in the truck, and then I'd switch them and then the other three guys could go in, something like that. That's how I remembered it. So this one time I went in, and um, I'm looking around, and this is after a full day of working, and as most of you know, I'm not the, I have some clothes that are maybe a little bit tattered in town, you know, and a little bit jacket or whatever. So, so I, uh, the I, uh, you were wearing that day, right? Yeah, so, so uh, we were all done working in the woods, and I went in, and I got back to the, and I said, we're all done, came back out, and the guy said, well, I got an interesting story. He says, the proprietor of the store came over to me, one of my guys, and said, thought he was a boss and asked him, asking him questions about, well, you know, what are these guys in for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had to tell him, he's the inmate, and I'm the boss. <laughs> So that is, illustrates what, what kind of clothes they wore, sometimes better, just, just like this. They go just like this. And Steve's wardrobe is still no different. Yeah. It has some challenges. Yeah. yeah, this is Steve's equivalent to a tux, right? Yeah. Um, just Steve, a, uh, I just have a little tiny story. Okay. In go for terms it. of for clothes and no clothes, bare chested, they're um, mowing the back um, where the. Um, up at the old school, Warwick Center School, and they would do mowing around the grounds, and it was Ju early June, and it was a hot day, and meanwhile, I had to let the kindergartners up and uh, out on the playground to have a little uh, outdoor time, and first one out was little Stephanie Matthews, and she comes running back in, and she looks at me, there's a bunch of Indians! 
hands on So, anyway, that was her first uh, exposure to a different race. <laughs> just just a, a quick thing here um, to kind of put a lot of the escape stuff sort of in focus uh, a little bit. Um, I was at the time, I don't know, 70s to mid 80s on the police department in town. And we had what was called the blue phone system, which rang in however oh. many people were on it. Um, I was like, yeah. Exactly. And it would ring in all of the houses, and we would have a duty officer. That person would, if he or she, Betsy, uh, would pick up the phone, um, and they would answer it. And then after the person who had called uh, hung up, then everybody else would come in, and we would sort of figure out what was going to happen. Um, with the forestry camp, um, we would get the call. Uh, sometimes somebody would stop by my house if the cruiser was in front or something, but say we got the call. And the phone rings, okay, there's been a prison break, uh, what time did it occur? And I will just say, after having been through a number of these, we basically didn't trust anything that we were getting on the phone. Uh, the point being is that uh, Prisoner X uh, decides to walk away. He leaves, I mean, they. He leaves at uh, moments after bed check, whatever hour that happens to be, and then he beelines most often, as George has said, and a number of people alluded to, to his girlfriend's car who's parked up on the Richmond Road, the way they go. Um, MCI Warwick, everybody, okay, code, whatever it was, they would, they would start checking all the beds, they check it eight or ten times. We wouldn't get our call oftentimes until two, three, four hours after the event that actually occurred. And I think Lenny can probably attest to this. I don't know whether you guys at the barracks got an earlier call than we did, but you know we were really the first responders on this thing. So that was kind of the logistical thing. So, you know, for George or, I mean, that's a very specific story about down on Hastings Pond, um, that kind of thing. But rarely did we see anybody see any signs of anyone, it basically it happened and they were gone. Uh, I will say for our group, which was Brian Peters, David Ray, on Puzzle Place, um, George, some of the time, because you were doing a lot of fire stuff then, uh, you know, um, we all had places where, sort of like hunters, we would go and post up, waiting for that deer to run by. No, waiting for that escapee to run by. It never Four happened. Hours later. Um, I will say, as far as an escapee, someone who actually took off, um, and I think as far as I know, and I'm going to turn this over to Lenny here and just so I put you on the hot seat. Um, Lenny was very often the first responder from the state police. I don't know whether that was his good luck or just how it worked out. <laughs> and I remember um, seeing Lenny, I can't remember, it was afternoon, evening kind of thing, and we just talked quickly about, yeah, blah, 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 and we're up in so-and-so and we're checking this area and that. And we all went off and did our thing, and then later on the police radio, I get a call that the person who had escaped uh, had been apprehended. And I'll, I'll just turn it over to Lenny Crossman, who was Massachusetts State Police and was a canine unit, had a dog, a big German Shepherd, who I think was mentioned earlier. Um, so, you can... Rather than keep my back to everybody, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll turn this back. And the fact that I'm half deaf, I won't be able to hear anything from facing that way. But I think, and it's funny, I was hoping Rod Whipple would be here, because I go back with Rod many, many years. And before I go into that, I, when I got out of the military in the early 70s, I worked for Massachusetts Department of Natural Resources. And we would come up here to Warwick and get our picnic tables <laughs> at the forestry camp that they made right there. And at the time, the forestry camp was supplying all the picnic tables for all the state parks in the entire Commonwealth. And it was pretty neat. So then when I ended up uh, leaving that department after 10 years and going to the state police, I get sent to Apple. So I was somewhat familiar with the camp. And I come up, I'll never forget, I, of course, at first uh, working midnight shift, having forced to miss a 4th of July family function because I was the low man on the pole and everybody took a holiday off and I was forced to work 
help a shift and stay. And it was my first day exposure to the prison camp. And I went up there and they had a cookout, they had softball games, they had hot dogs and hamburgers, <laughs> and bombs. And they said, boy, maybe I did the wrong thing. <laughs> you know? I used to think about little Johnny going home and say, Mommy, where, where was that place that we used to go see Daddy and the hell that food? <laughs> oh, that was prison. <laughs> but I, a few things Derek said I very much agree with how they're not all bad people. People who made stupid decisions, made stupid mistakes, and ended up in, in positions like that. And, uh, you know, they weren't the majority, but, but unfortunately they were there. And, and being marked with that former, you know, been an inmate, it, I, I, I very much understand how it can affect their future. But anyhow, I, Steve stopped by last week when we were talking, and I could think of that particular inmate's name, and I was hoping Rod would be here because that inmate's last name was Whipple. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, what it was is I did get called to most of them because I live over in North Orange, and I was a canine officer. So anytime any escape, lost person, whatever, um, I usually won one of the first bids to, to come out and look. But this particular uh, gentleman, Whipple, that left the, left the camp, and us too, quite often, we weren't notified for a couple hours either. Mm -hmm. They usually had a good head start uh, before we even got it. But we did figure out, I went up with the dog and started the tracking, and he did take off through the woods and headed up the power lines uh, trying to go uh, southwest, but of course the reservoir is in the way. And I got up to the reservoir and I lost the track. And, uh, okay, well, a little bit beyond the side of it. Well, later on, about I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, come to find out he stayed on the power lines, he crossed the reservoir, he went through the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my dog, you know, got to the water and I, I saw it. I said, well, He's not in the water, stupid. He came to the dog. Well, I was the stupid one. He was in the water. He didn't get on. He didn't cross it. But anyhow, he stayed on the power lines and he came out to Route 2 in Irving. And, uh, and I happened to go by and the guy comes out of the woods with the satchel over so at 3 o'clock in the morning in Irving. I don't know who he is. But of course, as soon as I stopped, he took off. Uh, but the, he didn't get too far with the dog uh, behind him. There was an old shed up there that he got into, and some of these people have talent. I went up to the shed and I saw her, it was locked, the glass was in place, there was a padlock on the door, and but the dog was adamant, he wanted to go in that shed. I said, come on, you don't talk, there's nobody in there. Well, he scratched, when he scratched on the door, when he scratched on the door, the window pane fell out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, this, this guy, poor guy, was so scared of the dog, mm -hmm. not me, the dog, you know, uh, that he, you know, he was very, very cooperative. There wasn't, you know, any any problems with him after that. But he was scared to death, and we took him back to the uh, back to the barracks and uh, let him leave. But he was a young man, like Steve said. He didn't know what he really didn't know what he was doing. He he was he was scared. Uh, all of a sudden, he got an instinct to go. And I've seen him, and I've seen him admit to me that uh, this is the best living they've ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, they got a roof over their over their head. They got a warm place to sleep. They got all the food, three meals a day, and they uh, hey, two, three days left of parole. I'm gonna take off so I can come back. Yeah, I don't wanna leave this place. And, uh, and sadly, that's you know, uh, what of the upbringing and everything else. But one I thought was the funniest of a couple of inmates that took off. They, they took off before dinner, while it was daylight. They had a plan. They were going to go to a certain spot, and they knew they could get there before it got dark. And uh, so they headed off through the woods, and they were gone about, well, probably eight hours, close to eight hours. And I come on at 11 o'clock at night, and I get sent immediately up here. Which, by the way, it was the policy of the state police that we only had two patrols out of the alcohol barracks from Fitchburg to Gill. Wow. Wow. So including, you know, towns that didn't have full-time departments. But I always liked the rural patrol. Nobody else did. They wanted to go up in Route 2 and go east and west and east and west and east and west. <laughs> so that wasn't me. I, I liked the rural patrol. So I always got the, always got the rural patrol. But these two guys have been out for eight hours. They've been out, out running. And I come out at 11 o'clock, and the first call was to go up to the camp. To, to this, uh, two inmates missing. 
Oh, it's caught by Bowers Fond, there's two guys walking down the road. I don't know, guess what? As soon as I saw it, they just... <laughs> And they're funny because they said, how did you know it was us? How did you know it was us? We've been running for eight hours. They ran in a big They came right up by Paul's farm. Almost all these guys are from the city. Yeah. They had no wood skulls at all. And the bugs here were more. What would drive any in there? We had one leaf, made a big circle, and comes out of the woods. Right to the cruiser. <laughs> well, can I answer any, any questions as far as what I? Well, just in, in the kind of a general question, though, maybe in your experience, how often would these walkaways or jailbreaks happen? Like, like two a month? I, no, I every other it, month? Uh, I think at the peak it was maybe ten a year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every month? They, they rarely went in the cold weather. Really? <laughs> <laughs> there was that, and, and Lee, they also tended to happen in clusters. And so there would be like three that would happen in the space of like a month. Yeah. Um, and Lenny and Ron again. Oh, okay. And they were surprising that some of the people that we did would come from far away to, to get the, to, to pick them up. Mm -hmm. And they always, you know, quite, quite often they thought too that for some reason we had to New Hampshire once we're over the state line, nobody can do anything about it. No, <laughs> so the New Hampshire State Police was part of our protocol when we had an escape. The New Hampshire State Police team was advised as well. And they always hung around the borders uh, when, when that happened. They were all very cooperative. But I don't remember any of them ever going up over the state line and getting caught over there. But it was part of our protocol that they were they were advised anyhow. So that's it for me. Thank so, you, Lenny. So I guess, it, like I say, my attachment to Warwick is, you know, started in uh, <laughs> 1971, 72. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I came up here to get picnic, picnic tables. tables. <laughs> and I said, back to Warwick. Yeah. <laughs> Why are we getting picnic tables from Rhode Island? <laughs> So, um, I think we're, we've got more questions all of a sudden. I just, you know, being in the Orange Fire Department before I moved up here, uh, these were pleasant experiences with the prisoners, or inmates. Mm -hmm. uh, first round we had a house fire up on Hastings Heights. I forget what time of morning, but I know come time to eat breakfast, here comes John Cook. Open up the back of the wagon. There was more food in there than a 20 firemen could have eaten. <laughs> but that was the first one. The second one was the fire in orange, sorry Steve, at a sawmill. We had thousands of feet of hose out. John Cook brought inmates down. And I was so happy to see him. I probably was hugging him because <laughs> I needed help picking up hose. Mm. And following that, one night we were at the fire station here, John Cook Scott handed me a letter, recommendation for a job at the Franklin County House of Correction. I got the job. Oh, nice. so I never asked him for it. I don't know how he even knew I applied. But I, and uh, Carrie wanted to be here today, but uh, she couldn't to share some memories. But. I'll just say, and it was alluded to, uh, the picnics and the food that she remembers going up there as a child and just having a big fun time with everybody there with all the food and so forth. Right. One, one of many, many. Why didn't you? Yeah, um, when the camp first opened, we lived, we were next door neighbors. We lived on Richmond Road. We had a farm up there. And, uh, um, my mother was pretty nervous about this place opening up and everything else and uh, so we decided to move and <laughs> we moved over to Old Winchester Road which wasn't any further away from the prison <laughs> but there was a lot more thick woods in between <laughs> so there was water in uh, it yeah yeah so um, uh, but we moved there but one thing I remember when I was a kid was at Christmas time 
they came around, a bunch of the inmates, they brought them around and they gave us kids candy. They came and knocked on the door <laughs> and handed out candy to us kids in the neighborhood, little bags of hard candy. I remember them doing that maybe two years or so. And uh, so. Does anybody remember cars repaired? Mm. Yeah. Oh, you're getting a car fixed, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, they the Jim McCrae's yeah. Oh, I remember uh, when Ray Bone <coughs> was working with us, he talked about the shops there mm. and they collected all the fi old filing cabinets they could get from anywhere around the state and that's what they repaired wow. vehicles with. They tore them down and used the sheet metal to fix cars mm -hmm. and, or, or build other things. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the same thing with the wood shop. They would get wood and build all kinds of stuff, the, the ones that had an aptitude towards that anyway. But, so you might have had an old, if you had body work done, there was probably an old file cabinet in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go back there to Keith. Uh, there was another time I remember uh, when I was with the Board of Health and, and we had just started dump stickers, maybe for about a year. It was five bucks for a whole year for a dump sticker. Wow. And, um, but the prison camp would never buy one. They were not going to pay for a dump sticker. And they would show up with a truck, you know, to empty it into the hole every, every week. And uh, so finally we sent them a note and said, look, you've got to buy a dump sticker if you're going to come to the dump. And, uh, so, um, you know, people were talking about it in town, and so they showed up with a truck full of stuff, and uh, they, they weren't going to buy a dump sticker, and then this car pulled up behind him, and I can't remember the guy's name. He's since died. He lived across the street from the tax collector, um, Vietnam vet, you know, really nice guy. But he, uh, he, he came up to the window where I was talking to him, and he looked in at them, and he says, is there a problem here, Keith? You know, and they all looked at him and they said, no, nope, no, nope, here's the five dollars for the sticker. <laughs> and he said, he knew what was going on because he'd seen him go by his house on the way to the dump and then he jumped in his car and followed him all the way. Uh -huh. So, he did a good job that day for us. That must have been Roy Felton. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask her, it sounded like you had a story about an encounter with an escapee. Or maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. No. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm Doc. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so uh, I better tell the story because I, otherwise I'm gonna. It's never gonna be recorded. But yeah, I used to actually go to a barber and get my hair cut. The <laughs> uh, barber in Athol ran a little shop across from the old uh, railroad station and I went there and I'm sitting in the chair and I said yeah I'm from Warwick and he goes oh yeah you know I used to know the Bowers that were up there and they told me a story about one time a, uh, an inmate got away from the jail and he got to the uh, Bowers area where they were right near the four corners there and the boys caught him and they, they got him a big bear hug and so they dragged him into the kitchen and, and they called the uh, the, 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 the uh, jail and said, oh, you, you know, we got we got an inmate here, you know, what, what do you want me to do with him? And they said, okay, we'll just hold him there until we get there. And and one of the Bowers boys says, well, you want us to rough him up a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Just hold him until we get there. <laughs> that inmate was very happy to come back to the <laughs> They were absolutely petrified of those two guys. <laughs> they, they had the big buckets of swill, mm -hmm. and it would take two or three of them. One of the bowers would take one in each hand. You know, and lift them up. <laughs> and we, we, they would call them Grin and Barrett. <laughs> you know, Ivan, just a quick one. There could be one of these sessions on Bower's story. <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions? Stephen. Uh, just a couple of things. One is um, to listen to you, Lenny, talking about the escapees and things. So my first story, true story, about escapees. So this one time, uh, this, this guy who came in, he 
um, talked to the officer in charge. He said, I can really make this place look really nice. He was a, like a walks and grounds guy. And he was given a free reign to like put in flowers, cut the grass, do the edging. We had uh, seven, six or seven um, um, buildings, about six foot by six foot, that housed our, our, our little um, fire apparatuses, like, like a... Hydrant. Hi, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Hi, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we built, we, we did, we did building, put, put buildings on that. He trimmed all around that, made it look really nice, painted it. That place, it looked like a country club. It really was really pretty when he was there. We let him do whatever he wanted to. He wanted to, you know, I, I'll call him Jim. They'd say, well, what, he's do what is he doing now? All the inmates we'd done working at 3 o'clock, he would go out there after supper and work around different things until one day. <laughs> hey, you seen Jim? No, no, I don't know the sawmill of I haven't seen him. Turns out he escaped. Jim's gone. Jim's gone. So the state police came up. And I don't know if they came up with a helicopter. It was once in a while a helicopter came up. I remember one time, I don't know if that was the time, but they come up and, you know, they would come and look and all the officers and all the staff members would get in cars and go around and look and look and you think, where the heck is he? Go up and down the road all over the place and couldn't find him. We never found him. Well, he got caught a little bit later and they interviewed him and they asked him, well, how did you escape and not get caught so easily? He said, well, he says, I went into one of the firehouses and slept there for the night, right, right within like 100 yards of the prison that was right on the driveway. He says, I stayed in there all day long and he never got caught and then he walked away that That's next night. That's because Steve wasn't, or Len wasn't there with the dog. No, no, he probably didn't, he didn't catch him. Yeah, he wasn't, that's how, so, so you know, he's just a different, he was thinking about how he was going to, how he did it. That's what he did. And then uh, just one more story I want to talk about, reminded me of something. So, um, at one point in my life, um, I had some uh, two Russian girls come to my house and stay there for six or seven days. There was a program in Franklin County, and myself and my partner at the time volunteered to have these two Russian girls. They were a physician and I think a person working towards their license. From, well, they were from Ukraine. So they came, and there were another 15 or 20 people from Russia that came. Come to find out, the Russian government let them, or the, the Ukraine government let them out of their, out, this is just before the wall came down, let them out, out of that country with $80 spending money. Almost nothing compared, you know, compared to what we have. So, um, so I asked the person who was running the program, I said, you know, I work in a prison, maybe, maybe the few of the Russians would like to go and, and see what a prison is like, kind of a weird thing, but come to find out there were four of them that wanted to go. So the four of us, I asked the superintendent, who was John Cook at the time, if we could come, and, 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 and we did. So I brought him in and I showed him around different places. I introduced him to a couple of different people. And in particular, I, I would think I was on maintenance at that time, so I brought him over to see um, one of these inmates who was doing a lot of body work for cars. I had one of my cars actually be built by him. And I introduced it to him, and I'll call him John. I can't remember what his name is. I introduced that to him. And they got talking back and forth, the Russians. Cause they could speak English, some of them, pretty, pretty well. And they told him how they, you know, the government only gave him $80. So I brought him back and brought the, the Russians back to, to their houses where they stayed for the night. The next day I came in, and the inmate came to me. and says, is it true? They only let him out for $80. He says, I want to give him some money. He says, I want to, there were 20 of them, he says, I want to give him 50 bucks a piece. I said, really? He says, yeah. So I went to John Cook. I asked him, I said, can we do this? He says, well, it's his money. So he allowed that to happen. So he wrote a check out for whatever, $1,000, whatever the math works out to be. And I brought that over to that, to that person who was running that program of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of, uh, the Russians visiting the United States. And they each got $50 extra. Mm -hmm. That was an inmate that did that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I, I think we're getting near the end of things here with uh, stuff. George, you've got a quick one? Well, do you uh, want to hear about the fire incidents? The fire incidents? Okay, I guess we better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on a positive note with a uh, fire, <clears throat> because of the investment that they made in this dormitory and <coughs> buildings, <clears throat> they put in a hydrant system. They had a big pump down in the reservoir and they fed a pump 
pipeline up the driveway, up behind the building. They had regular fire hydrants every so many feet, just like Orange or Atom. And they had a switch in the office's office. In the case of a fire, you could throw a switch and that pump would start up. It was run with propane. And those hydrants would be charged just like a hydrant in Atoll or Orange or Greenfield. And um, they were, <coughs> we used to go up there and drill with them using the hydrants. So it gave us a little practice on how to use a hydrant in case we went to Orange or Atoll. And then uh, <coughs> they would let us fill the trucks if we used them somewhere else in the area and they needed to be refilled. They'd let us refill the trucks. But then at each hydrant, they had a <coughs> shed with some holes in it. And uh, inmates were trained, you know, to hook the holes up to these hydrants and put a fire out. <coughs> I can remember three incidents that we responded to. One of them was upstairs in the workshop around the equipment, a fire got started in a sawdust pile. So before we got there, they had the hydrant system going and they pretty much had the fire out. Another one, sometime later, there was a fire in the downstairs of that workshop in the garage. I think it was some junk or some old clothing or bedding or something that that uh, got caught on fire. And again, they had it pretty much out by the time we got there. But the one that I can remember, <laughs> somehow an inmate got a hold of a whiskey bottle. And he made a Molotov cocktail. Oops. And they smashed the window in the superintendent's office and threw it in. And the superintendent's office just got completely demolished with this Molotov cocktail. I think the guy at the time that was superintendent was a, a uh, Harold Woodard. Does that ring a bell? Nope, before Har my time. Yeah, Harold Woodard, I think. <clears throat> but that time, the inmates had the hose out and they had it pretty well under control, but they still needed us. We, we had to do the cleanup and check it all out. And uh, But on a plus side, you know, that, that hydrant system really came in handy for us. We used it for that house on Hastings Height. Some other places in the area, they threw the switch and let us use it just like it was our own hydrant system. But that... Uh, Bombing of the superintendent's office. <laughs> that was my big one. <laughs> Michael, you got? Oh, I have a very short one. Um, uh, the town has a really nice Santa Claus outfit. And um, it has it because, uh, I don't know, I think it was you, Steve, who called me one day, we were coming up on Christmas, and uh, he, I think it was you, asked, it, asked me if I would be Santa Claus for the uh, prisoners' kids who would come to visit them uh, right before the holiday. And uh, so I said, yeah, sure, well, that was pretty cool. So um, I got this, uh, I can't remember who gave it to me. Hmm. It was the old original um, Santa Claus outfit, which uh, Arthur Bowers had used for so many years, oh, <laughs> and it had a, it, I don't know if you remember this, but the, uh, stained with tobacco? <laughs> yes, big tobacco stains down the ear, ear like this, it looked like a Fu Manchu nicotine. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I got this uh, uh, call, I said, yeah, sure. So um, I go up and I, uh, I'm, waiting and I get this outfit and I put it on. That's when I thought, was it you, Carol, or somebody said, we've got to get a new one. So eventually we got a new one. But um, uh, I wound up sitting in that chair being Santa Claus. I would, it was almost 
three hours. <laughs> it was a long time because uh, we got about halfway through giving away some of the presents and whoever was in charge of it said, we don't have enough presents to go around. So somebody went out and went to somewhere and bought a whole bunch of Christmas presents, came back, and then they wrapped them. And the whole time I had to sit in that chair and I'm telling stories about how to help reindeer fly. Anyway, it was a big, uh, big effort on my part to keep those kids interested. And, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Okay, well thank you very much everybody, the panel and all the contributions yes. from the audience. Um, I think the one thing we should all be mindful, I hope we have helped you. Some of this is, is malarkey and nonsense, but a lot of it is good slaughter. Um, and I hope that uh, you can have that. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Steve.